Hi everybody, welcome to our webinar, welcome to the new year. Today we're going to focus on creating a collection plan. All right, a uh, little bit about us. I'm the founder and director of Relicura. I'm Rachel Woody and I just did the math again recently with the change of the new year and I'm up to 20 years of experience in archives, museums, and cultural heritage organizations. And in addition to being a subject matter expert in this industry, I am also a business owner, consultant, author, and speaker, and a people-first advocate. A couple housekeeping items before we get into things. The recording that you are taking a look at, all of the links that we provide in this webinar and a link to the recording will be provided uh, to you the next day. And also any of the links that we cover, if you're watching this in premiere mode and are with us live, we will also provide the links in the chat box as we go through each of the items. This particular session is pre-recorded so that I can deliver the maximum amount of information to you and answer any sort of questions or follow-up items in the chat box. Speaking of which, please feel free to share your own experiences, resources, etc. in that chat box. We are using the YouTube platform to do this webinar premiere. So if you have a YouTube slash Google account, you can use the chat box to participate. And speaking of using the YouTube platform, you also have access to all of the YouTube usual tools in its little video player. You can use the closed captioning, you can expand the video depending on what sort of device you're watching the webinar on, that kind of thing. And then just please remember to respect that this content is my intellectual property and subject to copyright. All right, contents for today's webinar. First, we're going to go over an introduction and the benefits of creating and using a collection plan at your home institution. We'll go over the common areas of a collection assessment, which will just be like a baby refresher to the webinar content that we covered last month together. Now, if you have not seen that one yet or were unable to join us for the assessment part, no worries, you do not need to have watched that webinar to enjoy today's webinar, just know that it does exist and you can check it out later. We'll get into then the collection care plan, so the, the care emphasis here as the first one third of a collection plan. We'll then talk about collection management plan, which is the uh, second piece of the collection plan we typically put together. And then the collection plan template for the future, which is doing some future casting and what sort of information would be helpful in this collection plan to support those immediate future goals. We'll then get into questions of which we've got a couple questions already from the audience that were pre-submitted. So we'll take care of those as well as any questions that you have while we're in the live premiere mode. Okay, introduction. So a collection plan is, the collection plan is specifically to support any of your present and immediate future actions. So we want the collection plan to be based on the current state of your collection, which is where a previous assessment is usually very handy and informative for a collection plan. However, if you're a staff member who has been with your home institution and collection for a while, that assessment piece is not always necessary to get to the collection plan part. You just need to have a, a very real and accurate understanding of the state of your collection. So um, point number one, know what you have and what state it's in. And then point number two for the collection plan is it's its job to support the immediate three to five years future goals of the organization. So this is where we want to think about what we need in place for the collections care and management and priority projects we have both now and in the next three to five years. I do want to note um, while elements of the collection plan may be considered timeless in terms of well we will always preserve things this way or catalog according to these standards. That is true however each of our collections and our setups are unique, and so there are going to be um, very real and specific things that may need to happen or be included in the areas that are otherwise considered timeless. 
Also, as our tools change, as our priority projects for that immediate future focus change, what you include in your collection plan, the emphasis, the level of detail, etc., will also or should also vary and be updated with those in mind. So the collection plan, at least from our perspective at Relicura, is that this is very much a living document. And while there are elements of it that can be timeless based on best practice, it is also intended to be a tool that you use to help improve and perform future projects and future collection care and management um, to the best of your staff and the organization's abilities. All right, the benefits of it. So why spend time, which is precious, doing a collections plan? So here are some of the benefits. It helps us to set intentions for improved collection care management, display and access. And with those in mind for the collection plan, making sure that for each of those elements, we are keeping our current collection state and resources, et cetera, in mind as we put those forward. It also provides a scope and prioritization for our upcoming work. So elements of the collection plan that we'll spend some time on a little later, you can see how scoping those out, how getting some specifics documented within this collection plan can help you in those next steps for, okay, we've we got the green light to do project day. Project day, we've already scoped. We know we need these things. Like you can immediately action it. So um, something that can be very valuable once you do get the resources you need. It can also aid in demonstrating the plan. So um, in terms of like, here is our priority project, here are the resources we need, here's the timeline, here's the scope, et cetera. And this is very helpful as a illustration of evidence for any fundraising ask. So an ask made of a donor or donors and or the grant application process. So just like the collection assessment was handy evidence to include in these types of things, so too is the collection plan, even if it's one that you've created yourself uh, versus one that came from like an outside consultant. And then finally, the information in the collections plan can be very helpful when advocating for an increase in staffing, contractor assistance, getting fancier, better equipment or collections management system, you name it. As you document these things in your collection plan, it can help you build that case towards getting in better resources, increased resources and capacity, that kind of thing. When is a collection plan useful? So we would definitely argue a collection plan is useful at any time because it very much can help guide and keep everybody focused on those immediate future goals and be very intentional with the limited resources that we have. But it can also be very useful at these critical times for either when a collection is just started. So if you are at one of the organizations that tend to be on the newer side or have just been more um, newly formed, not having collection policies necessarily in place yet, not having a more detailed future plan other than getting started, a collections plan can be very useful for these next first steps. Also, if your collection has existed, but maybe it's not been formalized or there was never really a moment or chance to sit down and be intentional with a collection plan, this is where having that plan and taking the time to do it can be very helpful as you're formalizing different elements of your either organization or collection. And then also when the former collection has existed and the organization has been around for a while, but maybe there's been changes to policy, maybe there's been major staff transitions, different goals, uh, maybe there's a new strategic plan any of that that has impact or changes to collections care or management, this is where a collections plan could be very helpful in these states of transition as things are being newly established or reevaluated before they're um, either instituted or changed again. So having this collections plan, again, I would argue helpful at any time, but in these particular situations, especially are when we are usually called in, as consultants to help with that planning piece. 
So who creates the collections plan? It can absolutely be you. So you as a staff member, um, someone on your staff, uh, a very skilled volunteer or board member, for example. So it can absolutely be you and still be a very valid plan. It can also be anybody with access or familiarity to the collection or the goals. And it can be an outside person. So this is where like it could be a board member if they happen to have that particular skill set and knowledge of your collection in mind. It may also be helpful depending on where you're located and what professional organizations you might have access to. There can be um, mentors, colleagues, um, people from peer organizations that all may offer or be able to help assist with a collection plan. And then of course you can get outside expertise in by working with a consultant in order to do that um, either collections assessment and or plan or both um, as the outside person coming in doing that assessment and or collections care and management plan. And then benefits of working with a consultant. If you attended last month's webinar, the benefits are the same in terms of having that outside person who brings in expertise and perhaps a broader frame of reference. As consultants, we've seen a lot of different shops and sort of, you know, peeks behind the curtains of the different collections. And so we can pull from those frames of reference and what we've seen in the past that may be applicable for your particular institution or collection. We are also able to perform the work and not have it impact, or at least certainly not as much as it would impact the staff capacity if you were doing the collection plan on your own. And then it also just provides that outside voice with a different level of influence. Uh, I will a caveat, as I believe I did last month, where like if you are in place and you have the training and you've been saying the same things, this is by no means saying that um, your knowledge or skills are not uh, not good enough or up to par. Uh, unfortunately, it's more so it just seems to be the state of things where you could be the person who have said all the same things. <laughs> However, just having an outside voice um, for whatever reason just offers a different power dynamic. And so sometimes when we see those same things, um, it gets listened to a little bit better. So. For those reasons, it can be helpful. Even though you know what you need to do, you may need an ally in communicating that and getting buy-in from whomever is um, up above needing to, to do the yes or no. All right, common areas of a collection assessment. So this is the little baby refresher for us. There was a webinar last month we did on performing a collections assessment. So if you haven't seen that yet, you can go check it out on YouTube or if you missed parts of it, et cetera, want to watch it again, all of our back catalog is on YouTube, so you can catch it there. And for this refresher, the assessment piece of it is a survey of your collection and it's to establish that foundational knowledge about your collection and its current state. So if you are new to your particular institution, um, if you've only known a part of the collection and not the whole collection, uh, for a variety of reasons, performing that assessment piece first before getting into the collection plan can be helpful and informative. However, it's by no means a requirement to get into that collection plan piece. Uh, common areas for the assessment, so just a refresher of um, what is covered in that assessment part, especially if, as you go into a collection plan part, is considering the assessment scope, content present, the subject matter or topics of the collection, formats of the collection, as well as the location and size of your uh, either items and collection in total the storage, which includes security and climate, but also the housing, like the storage housing materials, and then any sort of preservation issues, management challenges, or risks that are present with the collection are all common areas that are typically covered in an assessment and then that subsequent assessment findings. So with that in mind, getting now into the collection plan and the first portion of which is focused on care. So in our collection plan report, I definitely recommend spending just like a brief moment of like one page maybe 
talking about the goals of the collection plan, what the purpose of the collection plan is, and grounding it in whatever sort of context that seems um, more able to inform and provide that information as to why are we doing the collection plan now, um, how that informs what, what we needed to help with, and what its job is. So providing that grounding information of your collection plan report before you get into the details of it, even if this information seems obvious to you. For the collection plan, uh, plan part, some of our content can include storage, which can be the space and the setup of it. And for purposes today, we'll focus on the physicality, so physical collections, physical storage, etc. Um, we have and will again talk about digital collections management a little later on this year. So just know that if you have those questions, we can definitely cover that in the next couple of months. And with that, talking about storage supplies and preservation supplies as part of this area. And when we go through these areas in a bit more detail, I want you to think of the framing as based on these areas, where can we make improvements? So whether you are just starting out you're re or you're reevaluating or establishing or reestablishing any sort of collections care, best practice, et cetera, as we go through the prompts, think about for your collections plan, how you can frame it, what sort of additional detail do you need to provide, what questions do you need to ask, that kind of thing. All right, so storage. Collection safe storage refers to both the storage facilities, so the actual location, um, temperature and humidity control, security of that location, as well as the actual storage material. So any sort of boxes, trays, uh, folders, encapsulate, whatever it is that is actually like holding the item or your collection in general um, in terms of materials. And for storage collection items are typically older and more fragile, no matter what sort of collection you have, that is um, fairly universal for all of our collections is that they're older and more fragile. And they can be very susceptible to the temperature and humidity fluctuations, sensitive to overexposure of light, any sort of acid transfer from either wood or deteriorating papers around it, um, especially if it's not in specific like museum or archival quality storage housing. Uh, pests, of course, and then any sort of disasters that it may be um, susceptible to, such as fire, water, whether that's leaks, floods, or the fire suppression system, and earthquakes. So there are things inherent in the collection to assess and mitigate. There are areas around the actual storage of that item in terms of the storage materials or the location, and any other sort of outside influences or as the insurance calls it, acts of God that could impact your collections based on what it's stored in, where it's stored at, and those um, outside influences. So quite a bit to think about. For the space, there are some considerations of the collection to keep in mind. First, this, um, the security of the space. So thinking about if there are locks or key cards that limit who has access to the collections, even within your own staff, it usually is not necessary for everyone to have access to the collections depending on their jobs. So having an idea of who has access, how that's controlled, if it's keys, key card, locks, etc. cetera. Uh, security cameras and or security personnel, depending on what your storage location site uh, logistics are in terms of where it's located, how big it is, um, what your financial resources are, et cetera. So considering all of those aspects of security um, as they may be appropriate for your setup. For the climate controlled aspects of the space, we have want to think about at a minimum the temperature control and trying to keep it for most of our collections between that 65 to maybe 72 uh, for our collections. Again, if you have collections, sometimes it needs to be colder and drier. Sometimes it can't be that cold or what have you, but for the most part, keeping it consistent and keeping it cool 
and dry, which is the next part, that humidity control and being desirable to keep it cool and dry. Again, for the majority of our collections, you may have some items that differ. And for that humidity piece though, depending on where you are geographically located, depending on your building and whether or not it is, um, to what degree it is climate controlled, which includes temperature and humidity, there may be uh, more or less urgency for you in terms of controlling that humidity gauge. We also want to think about the shelving, specifically metal shelving um, that has a particular coating on it so that it's, it doesn't rust. Um, and definitely make sure it's not wooden shelving if you can at all avoid it because wood is acidic. And so thinking about uh, the type of shelving you have in place, if it's the right type of metal, if it's rust proof, um, also the logistics of making sure it's not so tall that it's going to cause any structural issues to your, your flooring, especially if it's not on the, for whatever the first floor is. But also making sure that it is not too tall, that it's impossible to reach or put things, store items and retrieve them safely. When possible, and especially if you are considering shelving as part of your reassessment and potential new resource acquisition, thinking about getting compact shelving so that it can maximize the amount of shelving space that you have for your particular storage location. And then with shelving in mind, and especially if you're in the midst of choosing a new storage location or trying to get the evidence and argument for an increased storage location size, making sure that you have a room large enough to not just account for your current collection, but to also account for any sort of collection growth as the majority of us are usually still actively collecting and yet we also suffer from not enough space or perhaps no space. So really needing to account for that collection growth when at all possible. Um, but we'll also cover that again as we get into some deaccessioning a little later. So things to keep in mind for the actual storage space and materials. When we think about space setup, there's the storage space to consider for the collections, but also the working space. And so when you're thinking about your collections care plan piece of this, are there ways that you can improve the, the workspace as well as the storage space? So trying to think about, is there a workroom space that can be carved out or reassigned that is next to the storage location so that any sort of processing work can be performed right next to where the collections are being stored, which will help you to significantly limit any sort of additional logistics as well as mitigate any sort of additional risk that you may have to take when you're moving items out of storage for any sort of process work or digitization work, things like that. And when possible for that workspace, please also consider the humans that need to be in that workspace and the furniture that they will need. Um, I mentioned that somewhat with humor because often chairs and table space are like the last things that people think about for the workroom, as well as I would add plenty of plugins and or like safe uh, extension cords and power strips. So please make sure that there is both furniture as well as safe access to electricity and any other sort of tools like pencils or um, cleaning stations, uh, hand wipes if there's not a sink in the processing room, um, and also to help just you know, collections by their nature, especially if they're archival, can be quite dirty or dusty, so needing a way to help clean um, the actual work and processing space too is important. So the space setup, particularly for a working room area, should also be considered. And then to the storage materials, um, specifically for what are containing the items or the archival papers, each format is going to require slightly different storage container or encapsulation solution. So it's going to depend on the stuff that you have. But overall, for much of our collections, it typically requires rehousing materials that are acid free, sometimes buffered if it's a specific photograph type of collection 
but essentially any sort of safe material that's not going to alter or damage the item and in fact hopefully even protect it or buffer it from any sort of future damage either from outside influence or from its own like inherent acidity or what have you. So thinking about acid-free boxes or trays for your artifacts or artful collections, thinking about foam, tissue, or other soft moldable materials to help envelop and secure, especially uh, more fragile objects such as a ceramics collection, for example. And then for archives, in addition to those acid-free boxes, usually acid-free folders, interleaving paper, sleeves, etc., depending on the type of items in the archival collection. But again, every anything that is going to be acid-free, not add to or <laughs> um, make worse any sort of damage that is already on the collections, and hopefully protect it from future damage. And then preservation supplies. So these are always fun to think about, and uh, especially if you're thinking about a grant to help uh, purchase rehousing supplies and improved storage, for example. Preservation supplies can also be very handy depending on the collection that you have and the expertise on staff to use these tools. However, um, usually a good shortlist to have is silica packets. They can help with excess moisture. Uh, so pretty much in every sort of collection, but especially if it's heavily paper or textile, then having silica packets distributed <laughs> liberally across your collection is usually very helpful. Uh, thinking about smudge erasers, basically anything that can help easily remove any sort of dirt or residue that has been placed on the majority of uh, object or paper surfaces. Um, spatulas, which may not always be called spatulas, but help to um, get in between uh, or uh, help to remove very like thin and stuck items from each other, usually more in archival collections, but I have seen them used in pretty much every circumstance. Thinking of va a vacuum, whether it is a document or textile or otherwise just like a preservation specific vacuum with like um, low threshold um, power of removing any sort of dirt or debris. So usually there are some very specific and gentle vacuums available for preservation purposes, depending on your collection and the dirt that may be on it. And then thinking about Japanese tissue paper and vegetable cellulose, especially if there's any sort of mending that you need to do with paper, uh, especially though I've also seen it um, very creatively used on some textile collections and artist brushes, whether it's for helping to clean particular artifacts, or if it's to help distribute something like vegetable cellulose, um, having those soft artist brushes of differing sizes can be incredibly helpful as a preservation tool. Okay, so that was the first half. Collections care, the plan in place, thinking about your storage, what you need, rehousing supplies, and having a plan that captures what is there currently and what you need to help improve your particular circumstances. This next piece is going to be focused on the management part of the collection. And we're going to look at both like the physical and the intellectual management of it. So in terms of content, we're going to take a look at the proposed collecting mission as part of this collection plan. And that helps to guide several aspects of what comes next. We'll take a look at some administration recommendations that we at Relicura typically offer or include in our collections plan to an outside organization. We then get into the fun appraisal and accessioning. So using that collection mission and thinking about that next administrative steps of appraising things that come in and whether or not it's a fit. And if it is a fit, how you accession it, getting then into it's an item in your collection now, how we process and catalog it, and then taking a look at weeding, which is typically an archival concept, but um, we'll cover here, as well as deaccessioning, which weeding and deaccessioning are two different things, though the outcome may be very similar. And then finally, displaying access is usually a huge part, whether it's museum or archive collection as part of that management plan. 
So proposed collecting mission, whether you are just starting out, relaunching a program, um, reevaluating and perhaps refining or shifting your particular um, museum's collecting way forward. For all of those reasons, there are usually um, a need, there's usually a need to either create for the first time a collecting mission or to update and refine an existing collecting mission. So as a refresher, for those who maybe have never created a collecting mission before, a collecting mission should be based on a review of your collection if you've already had one in place and an assessment of past and or current use. So what has the collection been used for before if it's existed? What do we anticipate the collection to be used for moving forward? And then constructing one to three sentences a very concise statement of what that collecting mission is. And what we need that mission to include is specifically what is being collected, including subject matter, the time frame, and the types of items. And having that spelled out within those one to three sentences so that it is very clear for anyone who's like, oh, this item just came in or is being offered. Does this fit? You'll need to be able to use several points of criteria in order to assess that. So we'll get into that a little bit more in the uh, appraisal piece of this, but that's why we need those elements in this collecting mission. And if your current one doesn't have those elements, then it's due for a refresh. And then finally, um, the collecting mission itself, just know that it can evolve and that it's very much, it. the evolution should be based on the organization's goals and any sort of strategic plans that may be in place for you. Um, but regardless, anything that is set at that institutional level should be reflected in the collecting mission for your actual collection. So you may have like a museum mission, an overarching museum mission for your organization. And then this is a very specific what we are collecting, collecting mission. So two different things, though they should definitely see relation in each other. So when thinking about collecting mission, as you establish either for the first time or perhaps revamp your existing one, there are some questions and prompts you can consider as you go through this type of exercise. And especially if you are working with a board or a larger department on this, these prompts can be fun to work through as a team. First off, the who is the collection for prompt so often thinking about our stakeholders how the collection is being used how how and who are accessing it can be very informative to our overall collecting mission and what that collection will be used for having some use cases or examples can help be for those brains that need like a specific example can be very helpful for proving that point how does the collecting mission support or echo the organization's overall mission? So again, what, what's the museum mission, for example, and how does the collecting mission support or not currently uh, that museum mission? How will the collection be preserved, managed, accessed, displayed, and resourced? Those are all important aspects to have in place as we're thinking about a collecting mission. Uh, specifically, and for example, if there are not a lot of resources available to actually provide collection care, management, and access, then perhaps the collecting mission needs to be very narrow and focused on areas, um, very specific areas of collection where continued acquisition is desirable based on the resources that you have currently. And then for some of the institutions where there may be mixed collections or several different establishments of collections like museum artifacts, archival collections and reference collections, um, educational collections, you may have several different types of collections. And so thinking about how those are differentiated, whether or not they're included in a collecting mission, um, how they relate to each other, those are all important to suss out as well as you're going through this practice of um, creating and implementing a collecting mission. So administrative recommendations, this is an area that we typically provide specific recommendations to a museum or archives for helping that administration 
of the collection. So um, we're sharing these here in case it is helpful for you to think about as you're going through your collection plan creation. First of which, if there's no formal department, uh, we recommend forming like a collections committee or some sort of um, group in place to help support the uh, assessment, the monitoring, the decision making that help to shape the collections that are coming in and perhaps shape some of the um, and inform the items that may need to be deaccessioned. Two, craft and adopt a collecting mission. So you've put together a team or a group, whether it's uh, your own department or uh, made up of staff, volunteers and board members, whatever that collecting committee looks like having that collecting mission be adopted and approved. And then after that, putting in place the appropriate forms and policies after that. But for the forms, specifically a deed of gift form, and we recommend an accession form and a deaccession form. Those last two forms being internal specific documents to support the management piece of it. Uh, the deed of gift, which we'll get into some more detail in a moment, is very much a legal document and very important, especially if a artifact or collection is being donated um, by a donor to your particular institution. Uh, four, create a log, which can be a spreadsheet if you don't have a collections management system in place. And the job of this log is to help identify items that are coming into the collection, um, so that you can help keep track of those, especially for those that don't have um, like a full management track set up yet. Five, evaluate the current holdings against the collecting mission and accession or deaccession the materials accordingly. So if you've been waiting to do accessioning until you got the collecting mission in place, now's the time to start doing that vetting um, using um, appraising basically the items against your collecting mission to see if they're accessioned. And for items that may have already made their way into your collection, uh, evaluating those against the collecting mission and perhaps deaccessioning them. And then six, identify materials that were donated by a source external to your organization. So, uh, and specifically that are missing a deed of gift. So any items or artifacts that may have come to your organization um, usually via a donation method versus like you paid or there's some sort of paid acquisition of an item. Not having that deed of gift in that donor situation can be incredibly difficult to do anything to that object. It does open you up for risk uh, in terms of if needing to do any sort of collections care or deciding that it goes on display or is loaned. A lot of those decisions can't be made for those artifacts if you don't actually legally own it because there's no deed of gift on file. So um, there are, of course, areas and museums where things have come into the collection and we are not sure how they came into the collection, let alone who to contact for the deed of gift. That is actually fairly common among many museums. And there are some things in place um, that are not related to this webinar, but just know if you're in that boat, there are some different strategies you can follow to determine what are the laws of your particular state or region, um, what are some of the policies that you had in place when the artifacts came in, in the rough time frame, etc. So there is recourse if you don't have a deed of gift, um, of which, depending on laws, where you're located, etc., you have a, a path to follow. Okay, so for the appraisal piece of this, appraisal is the process that a museum or archives goes through to determine whether or not an item or archival collection is appropriate for you to take in. And when items are offered to your particular organization, there's usually that an initial appraisal done by internal staff to gauge the appropriateness and whether or not that item should be added based on how it fits the collecting mission for your museum or archives. Um, I will state this type of appraisal is very different and not the same thing as a financial appraisal. Um, this is very much appraising an item, evaluating it essentially to determine whether it should be in your collection. 
And if the items fit within that collecting mission, then doing any sort of additional review to help inform uh, the physical state of the item. Does it need any work or repair on it? Um, does it need to be fumigated or isolated for whatever potential um, pus situation that may exist? Uh, so any sort of um, immediate, and especially if it's like preservation related things that need to occur. And then just please note, um, for the appraisal policy that you create for part of this part of your collection plan, I definitely recommend putting in a statement somewhat similar to this one where it states specifically that your organization cannot and should not provide a financial appraisal for the particular items that are coming in. Um, this is in keeping with the current code for both um, Society of American Archivists as well as the American Alliance on Museums, where the ethics of the museum or archives providing that financial appraisal is dubious. And so um, don't provide that financial appraisal. And if there is a donor asking for financial appraisal, et cetera, then recommend them to one of the official appraiser professional organizations for them to find and locate their own appraiser. So having that statement as part of your appraisal policy so that you can avoid and mitigate that risk as well as be able to point to it for the donor saying, I'm so sorry, it's against code of ethics, et cetera, that we provide the financial appraisal, but please go check this other place out to find your appraiser if that's the step that you want to take. So please include that and note that in your appraisal policy. So once you've done that appraisal piece for your collection plan, you also then need to include how to accession. So for this part of the collection plan, there's a few different areas that we want to think about and outline for accessioning. And the three areas over here is legal, physical, and intellectual. So for accessioning, how can we do those three areas for the management of the material? For the legal aspect, we want to think about for potential items coming from a donor, a deed of gift should be used. Uh, as mentioned briefly a couple slides back, a deed of gift is a legal agreement that transfers ownership from the donor to your organization. And depending on what it is, it could come with copyright, etc. cetera. Um, because it is, um, if you're accepting donations from an external source, and you're doing it without a deed, it can be risky because that opens up your organization to potential future litigation of who actually owns that object, especially if the original donor passes and it's not being contested by the heirs. Also, um, it can help mitigate risk for the demand of return of that collection and therefore sacrificing um, or forfeiting any sort of staff time, supplies, and other resources that you've put into that item with collections, care, and management um, because you then have to return the item because it wasn't officially owned by you. And then as the deed of gift is considered a legal document for your museum, it should be vetted by some sort of legal counsel for your organization. So while a deed of gift is pretty standard and you can probably borrow one from an, a different museum and adopt it for your own use, it still should be vetted by whoever the legal counsel is, or if you have a board member who provides that legal expertise um, as you start using it so that you, you know, the, the cover your butt situation. So thinking of the fiscal aspect now for how to accession, when we're accession accessioning, we are accepting the new material and we want to make sure that we establish at that point some physical and intellectual control. The physical control of that includes the rehousing of that artifact or archival materials in some sort of appropriate museum or archive quality storage, and that that item should be placed somewhere that is in secure storage in a location that can be identified and assigned um, and not just like placed on like a volunteer's desk, for example, because <laughs> that's how things get lost. So being very intentional for once that item does come in, even if you can't work on it right away, that it receives appropriate storage materials and then it has been assigned an official specific and documented location. 
speaking of the intellectual control of this is controlling documenting and controlling the information of the item or collection. So information about the item should be captured and typically this is done within the collections management system. But if it's a spreadsheet for you, spreadsheets fine too. Wherever it is where this um, information is documented, this is where it should happen. And for your collection plan, that should be identified in terms of where people should go to enter in the collection data. And then also articulate in the collection plan for this section what information you expect to be gathered at that point. So for uh, some of the basic data to capture as an option, capturing donor name, creator name, creation date of known, brief description, and this can really just be like a brief enough uh, fragmented sentences, bullet points, whatever, of what the item is uh, or what the archival collection is, assigning of an accession number and location, and having those captured as part of the accession record. That way it's all in one place and we have all of that information to help intellectually control or manage the object, even though we may not have had time to actually go through the full processing of that particular item or archival collection. All right, so we've appraised, we've accessioned, and now we are going through the concept of process. And so for your collection plan, this section should speak to how you want to organize your collection. And for the processing piece, what that typically means, whether it is a museum or archives, is it's that there's both a physical and intellectual control of a collection. So we did like a little part of that when we went through the accessioning of it, we are now expanding upon those two concepts as part of processing the artifact, artwork, artful collection, what have you. And that can include documenting what an item is and where it's located in more specificity, uh, rehousing or improving the storage containers for the items. So perhaps we had enough time to put it in an acid-free box, but it could really use some different encapsulation or some more foam. And then any sort of um, need to conduct additional research, uh, whether for provenance, creator, what have you, and then further filling out any known data on the item or the archival collection. Which leads us very nicely into the cataloging piece of this. So in your collection plan, once you've gone through the appraisal, accession, the little bit of processing, thinking about how that next goes into the catalog as a full item or archival collection record. And for your plan, you'll want to determine what the cataloging um, activities or steps should be to take place. For example, a spreadsheet or a homegrown database, uh, or if you have a collections management system, so identifying what it is that your staff or volunteers or whomever should use. Identifying the data standards that you typically follow, the descriptive standards, providing examples for those descriptive standards, and identifying any sort of lexicon or vocabulary control, um, for example, nomenclature or um, art architecture thesaurus from Getty, any of those lexicons that you may want to use. And then having those documented, whether it is you've always used those and then you're documenting to continue using those, or perhaps there was never really a, a specific adoption happening, but now at this point in time, we are now following these standards, etc. And then providing those instructions for how to capture that data that meets the adopted standards and the designated location. And so in this case specifically, is it the spreadsheet? Is it the collections management system? Where does this data go? How to weed the collection. So this will not happen quite as often, but it's often a good section to include in your collection plan. And particularly so if you are working with an archival collection, weeding or the concept of weeding tends to be more common in those types of collections. And that is because the act of weeding is typically not deaccessioning because it is weeding very specific items that are either uh, complete duplicates, non-original materials, materials that were prolifically created or produced, etc. So items that are not going to be unique, 
items that are not going to be like original artworks, um, items that are not going to be completely unique and original, that type of thing. Those are okay to weed, and that's why it is considered weeding versus deaccessioning. Deaccessioning is a bit heavier. There's some um, ethical and legal things to consider when you deaccession, and so um, there's a, a distinction in terms of the significance of the action based on what it is that is getting disposed of. And in your collection plan for weeding, it's very important to provide that criteria for what is being weeded and instructions for how to dispose of those materials if you are weeding. Another distinction for weeding versus deaccessioning in a de uh, disposal uh, set of circumstances is that for weeding, you can often just like recycle or toss or um, it, depending on what the item is, perhaps people are interested in um, receiving those or collecting those. So you can very much find another home or otherwise dispose of without giving much thought to it. Deaccessioning, there's some more significant uh, thought, thought that should be put into it as well as potential repercussion for the disposal piece. So how to deaccession, this, this webinar has this one slide. We will definitely have a deaccession webinar coming up in the next couple of months um, that will be all about deaccessioning. So um, just know that that content is coming and will be a whole hour dedicated to the act of deaccessioning and creating policy, etc. But for our collection plan for this webinar today, I do recommend having a section on deaccessioning, much like we had for weeding where you can establish in this plan based on the collecting mission which items are no longer serving the collection um, perhaps they never fit in the collection to begin with and what sort of prompts should people follow to help identify those items in a collection that should be considered for deaccession as you go through those and as you're putting this piece in your collection plan, thinking about any sort of paperwork or older policies that the item uh, deaccession may be subject to that you will need to consider and identifying those if they exist in the collection plan so that everybody is aware they need to check those. And then identifying the steps for deaccessioning. So including the attempt to return to the donor to transfer the items to perhaps a peer museum or collection, or to ultimately dispose of that item from the collection um, through a variety of, of different methods um, as you deaccession items from your collection. So it's a little bit heavier, there's policy and whether or not um, there's a deed of gift involved to consider, and it's actually identifying something that is completely original, is not a duplicate, et cetera, that falls underneath a different deaccession policy. So for your collection plan, call it out for the management piece of your plan, and then attend the deaccession webinar in a couple months where we'll spend much more time on both this concept as well as thinking about and the creation of a separate policy. All right, and then collection display and access. So every collection is going to have unique needs specific to how it is displayed, how it is accessed, how often. And so considering for any of those items, regardless of collection, both the preservation and access needs of those items and how to best balance those two pieces uh, in order to support the stakeholders and the users of your collection while also maintaining and ultimately managing the health of your collection. So in your collection plan for this section, including and documenting a series of prompts or specifications for you and staff to consider as you facilitate the collection display or access. And collection plan template for the future. So we covered collection care plan, we've covered the collection management plan, and now we're in this last piece, which is thinking about that future three to five years, how this plan can help inform like the what's next part and the perhaps what's next priority projects. 
So first piece of this that is probably of most interest to everybody and is a piece that we typically include in the collection plans we do with our clients is a recommendation for priority projects to come up next in these three to five years. So based on what we know, based on the policies and the management that we've just established in this collection plan, what needs to happen next? And identifying three, could be a couple more if you want it to, but three priority projects and helping to capture in the plan enough information that will identify what the project topic is, what the scope is, the duration, the output, and what resources you need in order to execute that project. And I recommend including this section for a couple of reasons. First is that it helps to move your collection forward and improving either collections care, management, access, what have you, depending on what those priority projects are, it helps to keep you moving forward. Second is that it is something that you can identify and document that you can then use as an advocacy tool, whether that is to your boss, to your board, to help lobby for and get additional resources or at least focus time on those projects, as well as a tool that you could use to help establish and build out a donor request, um, a call for donations, a grant application, what have you. And so having those identified and documented, even if you as the staff member are the one creating this collection plan, it can still be very helpful to use and point to as a piece of evidence that you have done the groundwork, you've done that assessment piece, you've identified it, you've scoped it, and you are now ready to execute any one of these three priority projects, for example. So it helps you not only have the information you need to like get started right away, but it also helps to demonstrate and convince whoever it is that you need to convince that it's a project that should be done and is ready to be done right now. More recommendations um, included in the collection plan is for future improvements. So maybe it's not under the auspices of like an entire project and is perhaps more, um, more broadly applied, but considering any sort of equipment, software, um, supplies, display or storage, contractor, consultant, personnel needs, like any sort of resources that you may need that can provide overall future improvements to your collections care and management. Thinking about and identifying areas where these additional resources can provide that improvement and as you're thinking about care management and access. And if you have some specific examples, I definitely recommend you write them down while you're thinking about them. And then finally gathering options and approximate costs for all, each of or all of those areas that you've included as resources. The more information that you have, including like different consultants or contractors that you may want to work with, as well as approximate costs for different um, improvements that could be made, can all be very helpful for you more quickly executing or getting that yes to move forward and getting those resources. All right, so that was the recommendations future planning piece of which you can, of course, expand and contract as you see fit. But I definitely recommend spending some time in that section because it can be so helpful for moving forward any sort of future activity. And questions, we've got some time for questions in the chat and I'll go ahead and go through our questions we received. Question one, what should not be included in a collection plan? So the collection plan can certainly be as expansive or as focused as you need it to be. Ultimately, it's a document that needs to work for you. And so including those sections as relevant that we went through. Um, ultimately, I think I recommend identifying like the top immediate actions that you need the plan to support. For example, if um, you're lacking like a collection inventory in the current collection space, if that's one of like the immediate goals that you want to take care of in the next year or two, having areas of the plan set up and articulated to support that type of project is what I would suggest you focus on first. And based on that and based on potential future goals, don't include the content that's no longer accurate. For example, if the museum or archives has been around and has created policies before, 
while it is helpful to know that those have existed, it's not necessary for you to continue their inclusion in your collection plan because it's only going to bog it down with too much content. And if it's older, outdated stuff, that that is uh, even more not helpful. And then, of, of course, not providing or um, spending much time, if at all, in the collection plan on topics that don't support your immediate three to five year vision. Question, any suggestions for reining in a long established museum without walls program on a college campus as part of a collection management plan? So I um, have some questions for this, the specificity of it. So I'll answer the question as best I can. But if this is your question and I didn't quite answer it in the way you need it, please feel free to reach out and let me know um, and I'd be happy to provide some more specifics. But based on what we have here and how I'm interpreting the question, I'm getting a sense of because we want to rein in a collection that's been going on for a while. So I'm envisioning that there's perhaps been like some scope creep or maybe there were not a whole lot of parameters in place to begin with and so now it's sort of sprawling and I'm getting the sense that it's perhaps not well resourced um, which is just with the state of many of our institutions that's the reality so with those in mind um, in terms of what the concerns may be I recommend taking a look at the mission first so the collecting mission specifically um, or the mission for this program, if it's a specific collecting program. If it does not have a mission, then it needs to have a mission. So um, if there's no mission, create one, and one that fits the particular resources, scope, et cetera, based on um, the slides we covered earlier. If it does have a mission, but it is not specific or helpful, then it should be refreshed or refined or whatever word that will help make other people feel more comfortable if you need to get buy-in, but um, reining it in starting with the mission. Also, uh, in addition to taking a hard look and being very communicative about the resources involved or that would need to be involved for the program to continue in any fashion, um, having a sense and being very transparent and providing some outreach on what resources it takes for you and or your office to continue to run this type of program. Um, even if it's not growing, it's still going to take resources to sustain it in its current mode. So what does that look like? What do you need? Um, is it possible to get what you need? And making decisions accordingly. So if additional resources aren't available, um, if you only have this many resources, but the program needs this many resources, I'm making hand gestures. So you only have like a little bit of resources, but you need like 10 times more um, than scaling down to just the little bit of resources that you do have and making it clear that that it is only, <laughs> that's it's how the math maths, you can only do that much because um, you are not magic, unfortunately. And then thinking about priorities and goals. So while the collecting mission will help or the program mission, what ultimately are the priorities and goals for it? What are ultimately the priorities and goals for the work that is that goes into it or that it could be done with it? And helping that to uh, justify or help you advocate for more resources or um, that you can only do three priorities instead of the five priorities, like some sort of adjustment needs to happen in the math equation in order for you to meet the goals. So sometimes that can be subtraction of the goals. Sometimes that can be the increase of the resources. So ultimately recommending um, holding uh, old assumptions, past practices, and the we've always done it this way activities um, basically thinking of this program and the fact that it's it's been long established, it needs to go through a reevaluation process and part of that process may cause it to transform 
um, which is not a bad thing. And ultimately it does need to transform in a way where it can continue to be cared for and managed, um, especially if nothing is going to change on the resources side of it. So hopefully I've given you enough to, to think about and help support you in your question, but if not, please feel free to reach out with um, any more specifics or, or follow-up questions on that one. But uh, thank you, though. It was a, an excellent thought exercise to go through. All right, we have reached the end. Um, I haven't kept track of time. I think we're close to the hour, but if we've got some time, we'll spend it in the chat. Um, as always, please feel free to reach out if you have any follow-up questions. Um, you know the deaccession webinar is coming up. We'll also have a digital collections management webinar in 2024, but please let us know if there's any topics you would like to see or hear about next. Um, we haven't quite finalized the content calendar, so we still have some room for, for your ideas for what you need. And just thank you so much. Welcome to 2024, and I hope that it is a good one for you. See you soon.